The William T. Grant Foundation was founded in 1936 by William T. Grant. Uh, the longtime focus of the foundation is to support research on uh, improving the lives of young people. At the present time, we have two main focuses of our research. Uh, the first is supporting research on ways to reduce inequality. And the second is to support research on ways to improve the way evidence from research is used in policy and practice. Now today's webinar focuses on our reducing inequality area, specifically reducing inequality for English learners. And we have a four part argument for why we support research on reducing inequality. First, levels of inequality in this country are exceptionally high. And you can see that whether you compare the United States to other countries or you compare ourselves today to our own past. Second, high levels of inequality cause uh, economic and social harm. They are a drag on our productivity and they are socially divisive. Third, we are not paralyzed in the face of increasing inequality. On the contrary, social policies can combat inequality. Now, if you put those three points together, the levels of inequality are high, high inequality is harmful, but policies can fight against the increase in inequality, then what we need, and especially what the research community can contribute, is research to identify policies, programs, and practices that reduce inequality. When we initiated our focus on reducing inequality in 2014, we called out several areas that we thought were particularly right for research on reducing inequality. And one of these was inequality faced by immigrant origin children and youth and English learners. We commissioned a paper from Carola Suarez Orozco, Vivian Seng, and Hiro Kazu Yoshikawa on the challenges of reducing inequality for immigrant origin children and youth called intersecting inequality. And you'll find this paper also among the two handouts uh, attached to the webinar material. This paper argued that the context of immigration intersect to generate inequality. That's why they called it intersecting inequality. Because it's not just about immigrant status, it's about the intersection of poverty, newcomer status, language barriers, and undocumented status that created challenges in reducing inequality for immigrant origin children and youth. However, family and education provide context for alleviating inequality. And this comment generated a research agenda. First, placing immigrants as a core policy concern, as we have tried to do in our reducing inequality agenda. Second, recognizing that there are policy efforts that can aid immigrant adaptation, such as deferred action for childhood arrival. And third, avoiding a deficit framework. Don't begin, don't begin with the conception that this is a story about what immigrants lack and how we need to make something up for them, but rather understanding <laughs> that immigrant status is an asset, and we need to know how to use that asset and uh, support English learners to their success in education, the labor market, and uh, life in general. But this was not the end of our uh, home-generated products to stimulate more research on reducing inequality. We've produced three more documents, uh, a blog post by Vivian Louie on reducing inequality for English learners, research questions from the field, another post on a research agenda to improve outcomes for adolescent English learners by Carola Suarez Orozco and Vivian Louie, and most recently an essay in our uh, William T. Grant Foundation Digest on research to improve outcomes for English English learners. Links to these three items are now appearing in your dialog box. Click on these links or cut and paste, copy and paste them uh, to a document of your own for later perusal. 
Now, a key issue for improving outcomes for English learners is how can schools best organize children for instruction? Immigrant children and many children of immigrants who are born here grow up with a language other than English at home. That's a valuable asset. But it also poses challenges, especially in the face of institutions such as schools that are not always well poised to respond to those challenges and bring out the best in children. So the school success of English learners is a prominent topic of research. Of course, responding to heterogeneity in the classroom is hardly a new challenge. In fact, it's essential to teaching. After all, students enter at different levels of performance and effective instruction meets students where they are and carries them forward. And their different starting points demand different instructional responses. Age grading is the first and most obvious responses to heterogeneity. For more than a century, educators have also sorted students by performance levels into tracks or ability groups. The intention with ability grouping is to fit instruction to student needs. That seems logical and efficient. Why is this problematic? Well, it turns out that due to circumstances outside of school, separating students by academic performance may also separate them by ethnicity and social class. And so thus, just as we advance one goal of creating uh, uh, more homogeneous groups in the classroom so instruction can be geared to their needs, we work against another goal of integrating students from diverse backgrounds and walks of life. Moreover, homogeneous classes may lack the diversity that fosters rich discussions in classrooms. In fact, although tracking is intended to provide equally effective instruction to all students, that rarely occurs. First of all, not only are students tracked, but teachers are also often tracked, with those with stronger reputations being assigned to teach high achieving students, and those with less stellar reputation uh, often finding themselves in classes of low track. Moreover, tracking may create a cycle of low expectations. Students who are assigned to low tracks are there because their achievement levels are low. Teachers know that and communicate that to students. Students pick up on that expectation, perform poorly as a consequence, and the cycle is self-reinforcing. One writer has gone so far as to describe low-level classes as caricatures, carrying the outward trappings of regular classes. But when you look closely at them, you find fragmented instruction carved up into, into small bits and pieces that help maintain classroom control. In my own research, and you can see a reference in the dialog box, box to a related publication, in my own research, I found that low track classes find an emphasis on procedures as contrasted with an emphasis on discussion in high level classes. So consequently, partly as a result of unequal classroom conditions, inequality between students assigned to high and low level classes widens over time. Now research on tracking of English learners is a hot topic especially sparked by a landmark study by Rebecca Callahan, and we're putting the uh, references that I mentioned in the dialog box, uh, showed that track placement matters more for English proficiency than for, uh, than for academic performance. Uh, low track assignment, in fact, holds back the advancement of English learners. And this finding was recently backed up by Callahan and her colleagues in a recent national study. Mixed message studies shows that schools differ in how they place English learners. In one, play, or one case, students were automatically assigned, assigned to low tracks as soon as they were judged to be proficient in English. More broadly, there is variation across schools, but English learners are often overrepresented in low tracks, 
and underrepresented in high track classes. Ilana Umansky, who joins us on this webinar, has explained why English learners are placed in low tracks. Often their achievement on average is low. But in addition, their lack of English proficiency is mistaken for low ability. Moreover, English learners attend schools with fewer resources on average than schools attended by students who are not English learners. And course sequences divert English learners away from rigorous academic content. In Umansky's study, she demonstrated that while low achievers, while low prior achievement accounted for a lower level track placement on average, English learners were excluded from rigorous academic content irrespective of their prior test scores. Emerging evidence shows that tracking diverts English learners away from academic content. However, a simple response of, well, let's just place English learners in high track has also not worked out well. Karen Thompson, who also joins us on this webinar, has studied the mass trajectories of students in six California school districts that place most students in eighth grade algebra. She found that nearly half of the English learners had to repeat algebra when they went to ninth grade as schools fail to provide high quality instruction and additional language support that might have helped English learners succeed. Indeed, the research in this domain shows that the quality of instruction may be more important for English language, English learner success than the way students are organized for instruction. Research on English learners and research on chat tracking share some common challenges. Both recognize that heterogeneity presents a real dilemma for teachers that they really have to confront and deal with. Detracking efforts that ignore heterogeneity meet resistance and typically fail. Now, successful responses to tracking have two common features. First, they provide rigorous academic content for all students, no matter how students are organized. And second, they allow extra instructional time for low achievers to keep up and succeed, again, irrespective of the approach taken to uh, organize students for instruction. Studies of English learners show that it is essential to break the link between English language proficiency and exposure to academic content. So what can we learn from research on tracking on how to achieve this aim? Well, first of all, if we think about research on tracking, we can conceive of the challenge of effective instruction for English learners in a new way. At present, research on English learners is largely dominated by two main concerns. First, what language of instruction should be used? And second, when should students be reclassified from English learners to English language proficiency? But research on tracking brings another issue into focus, whether English learners have access to academic content that provides them, that prepares them for colleges and careers. By this logic, questions about reclassification and language of instruction follow rather than precede the larger issue of academic content. This logic also provides us with a criterion upon which to judge policy decisions, specifically which approaches best provide access to academic content. Research on tracking points to instructional approaches that may work for English learners. First, prepare students, prepare teachers, to differentiate, to differentiate instruction for linguistically diverse classes. Second, ensure that students learning English have access to rich academic content. And third, allow extra instructional time for English learners to keep up and master the rich academic uh, instruction for, with which they are being presented. This would move us 
from studying barriers to English learner success to conditions that support their progress. Just as in tracking research, instead of asking, should we group students homogeneously or heterogeneously, instead we would ask, what conditions boost the success of all children? So in research on English learners, instead of asking, should we organize bilingual or immersion classes, we would ask, what conditions promote access to academic content for English learners? And now I'll turn it over to Ilana Umansky from the University of Oregon. Thank you so much, Adam. It's really um, a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about some conceptual considerations in thinking about English learner tracking, followed by some data on different ways in which ELs are tracked. And I'll conclude with just some ideas about big buckets for future research. So let's see, yeah, thank you. ELs are tracked in ways that both parallel and deviate from traditional notions of tracking. Traditional tracking, as Adam has, des has described, um, is typically defined as placement by, um, based on prior academic achievement into higher level classes versus lower level classes. ELs are tracked in this way, and um, that's represented in this slide by the leveled tracking column. Um, uh, but ELs are also tracked in ways that typically do not occur with English proficient students. First, English learners can be excluded outright from core content area classes, including math or English language arts, science or electives. And here I call this exclusionary tracking. Second, English learners can be placed into classes that in theory don't differ by level, but are nonetheless separated out from mainstream classes. So two common examples for English learners are sheltered classes, which are content area classes that are designed to be taught using modifications to increase accessibility for English learners, and also bilingual classes or classes that are taught in a language other than English. So here I call that parallel tracking. So EL course taking can differ from non-EL course taking in all three of these ways. Next slide, please. Importantly, as Adam stated a bit ago, um, issues of quality cross cut all of these types of tracking. Prior work has shown that the quality of content and instruction is as important or more important than the structure of, in of instruction or the label assigned to a particular type of class. Accessibility is an issue that again is relatively specific to English learners. In fact, it's at the heart of the landmark Supreme Court case on the education of English learners called Lau v. Nichols. The judges in that case ruled that placing a student who doesn't speak or understand English proficiently into a mainstream class without accommodation forecloses them from access to content. In other words, the education that's provided in sink or swim settings is often entirely inaccessible to English learner students. Thus accessibility is also a core issue to investigate in any type of class. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna show you some data on how these types of tracking play out for English learners in one setting. I'm gonna talk just about level tracking and exclusionary tracking today. Um, the data that I'll present come from one large urban school district, a district where roughly half of incoming kindergartners speak a language other than English at home. Um, and these data that I'm gonna show you are all from the middle school grades, six through eight. So this figure here looks descriptively at level tracking. It shows the number of credits taken per semester by English learner students in blue and English only students in red by track level, grade level honors and remedial. And as you can see here, English learners take more grade level and remedial level classes, but far fewer honors level credits than English only students. So here we see the presence of leveled tracking, EL's overrepresentation in lower track classes and underrepresentation in higher track classes. Next slide, please. So this table by contrast looks descriptively at exclusionary tracking patterns in the same district. Specifically, it looks at students' likelihood of being in court content area classes based on their language classification, again, for ELs and EOs. Um, it looks at English language arts, ELA, math, science, and enrollment in a full academic course load. 
And here I'm defining a full academic course load as ELA, math, and science together. And note that it does not include English language development classes, which are a core class um, for, English, uh, for English learners, um, but, they are not, but it's not considered an academic content area. Um, so as you can see here, English learners are far less likely to be enrolled in a full course load. And this is driven primarily by English language arts. Only 58% of English learners are in English language arts in any given semester of middle school, compared to 99% of English only students. This is important because English language arts is considered a mandatory core content area that's tightly linked to being able to graduate and to be eligible to attend and enroll in college. Next slide, please. So this next slide tackles a different issue. Instead of looking descriptively at English learner course placement, here I'm showing how English learner classification itself impacts students' course access. So the slide is showing results from a regression discontinuity study in the same school district. And the effects here refer to the impact of EL classification on students' subsequent course taking as they transition to middle school. So the results, because it's a regression discontinuity study, apply only to students who at the end of fifth grade had English proficiency scores that fell near the reclassification th threshold. So res results of this work show that EL classification increases the total credit enrollment by three credits, but decreases the likelihood of enrollment in a full academic course load by seven percentage points. This somewhat confusing finding is driven by English language development classes supplanting English language arts classes. Specifically, English learner classification results in 2.5 more ELD credits per semester, but an 18 percentage point drop in the likelihood of being an ELA. This is important because as mentioned earlier, ELA is a mandated course and so is ELD within this district for English learners. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna close with what I consider to be some big buckets of research questions regarding English learner tracking. The first is how do English learners instructional, how does English learners instructional access vary by level? And I think it's important to think about how um, elementary and secondary levels uh, structure access differently and what the implications are um, for English learners access to content. Um, the second, um, is how do different kinds of tracking impact students' access to, to content? And here I think it's important to consider that even within a particular kind of tracking, for instance, parallel tracking, um, there may be differences in um, access to content, for instance, between bilingual um, classes versus sheltered classes. It's important to look at a range of outcomes, um, two most obvious being curricular access and test performance outcomes, but other uh, outcomes like student self-concept con self are also important. Um, and it's also important to understand how, uh, what, the, what the impact of different kinds of tracking are for different subgroups of ELs, for instance, long-term ELs versus newcomers. The third area here has to do with correlation and causation, and specifically, what are the implications for policy and practice of descriptive patterns of EL course taking? And what are the implications of, for policy and practice of the causal effects of EL classification on course taking? I think these are likely to be different. Most importantly, as Adam has underscored, how are policy alternatives and interventions working to improve English learners' access to full, rigorous, and accessible core content? And I've listed here a few of the kinds of policies and interventions that I think are, are really um, interesting and merit research on their impact. And finally, just a question, how can we both understand the trade-offs between differentiated versus inclusive schooling for English learners while also challenging the notion of the inherent nature of trade-offs? That's a zero-sum game. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Karen Thompson at Oregon State University. Thank you. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about one subject area in particular. So focusing in on math course taking and some analysis I've done looking longitudinally over time. We know from prior research that students' math course taking in high school is an important predictor, both of graduation, but also post-secondary enrollment and post-secondary success. And so in addition to 
leveled tracking and exclusionary tracking within individual school years being important, it's also useful to understand what's happening to students over time as they move through the grades. So in this study, I looked at six California school districts and I analyzed students' math course taking from seventh grade through 10th grade. And we see, as Adam mentioned earlier, I compared outcomes for current English learners, students who are currently classified as English learners, students who had previously been classified as English learners, which I refer to as former ELs, and then students who had never been classified as English learners. And we see that across all three of these groups, nearly half were repeating Algebra 1. So current English learners were not very different from other groups in terms of the proportion repeating Algebra 1, though of course it's concerning that all three groups had such high Algebra 1 repetition rates. Next slide, please. So also importantly, we see that students who repeated Algebra 1, when they took the course a second time, almost two thirds or um, two thirds exactly in the case of current ELs, actually scored better on the state Algebra 1 assessment their first time in the course. So school's response to the struggle that students were showing did not seem to facilitate math learning for current, former, or never English learners. We see that was slightly more true for current English learners, but it was also true for former and never English learners. Next slide, please. Then in other outcomes, current English learners did have different patterns than former and never English learners. So during this time period, California had a policy of trying to encourage districts to enroll all eighth graders in Algebra 1. And we see that um, substantially higher proportions of former and never English learners were actually enrolled in Algebra 1 in eighth grade during this time period than were current English learners. So this gets at the leveled tracking that Ilana described. Then we see that much lower proportions of current English learners ever scored proficient in Algebra 1. It's definitely concerning that among former and never English learners, only about 40% ever scored proficient in Algebra 1, but we see for current English learners that proportion is only 12%. And we know that Algebra 1 proficiency has important ramifications for students in uh, post-secondary outcomes as well. If students get placed into developmental math courses when they try to enroll in two or four-year universities, they can get trapped in a cycle uh, that makes it difficult for them to earn the credits they need to progress and, and earn an, a degree. And then finally, we see that lower proportions of current English learners were enrolled in an accelerated math sequence than former and never English learners. And I'll be happy to talk more about any of these results during the question period. Next slide, please. In addition to this quantitative data, I also did um, followed up with case studies of 14 students, primarily former English learners, but some current English learners as well. And I looked at their cumulative records from elementary uh, through their senior year of high school. I interviewed them multiple times. I shadowed a subset of them and I interviewed their teachers and their parents as well. And I was really struck uh, to by the number of students who showed this pattern I just described of having to repeat math courses over and over, not only Algebra 1, but Geometry as well. Um, and so we saw that in this district, all of the students actually were enrolled in Algebra 1 in eighth grade. So they had what we sometimes refer to as opportunity to learn. They weren't subject to the leveled tracking that we saw in some districts, but they struggled nonetheless. And in hearing students talk about the factors that influence their trajectories, it seemed as if earlier intervention, perhaps outside of conventional classroom settings, shifts in classroom practices away from didactic teaching and interventions that address math self-concept and mindset um, might have been useful. In these case studies, we also saw that the students who failed a math course repeated the same course again, often with um, no more success than the first time. And so again, it suggests that there's a real need to think about how should 
how can schools respond to struggles in math that are more productive than the practice of having them simply re repeat the same course they just didn't complete successfully. Next slide, please. And finally, many students had access to what on paper might seem like support. So many of the students were enrolled for some time in AVID, which is a popular college pipeline program. Uh, some One student was in a charter school that had a real focus on college matriculation. Um, but the students rejected what seemed like support when the utility was not clear, the costs were high, and or it did not have intrinsic value. So one student described dropping out of AVID because it was preparing, it was focused on preparing for a four-year university, and she had an older sister who had gone to a community college. She was really clear that that was the path she wanted to take, and she was frustrated by AVID. Um, but students were very creative and resourceful in finding support that they did find to actually be supportive. So two students actually sought out their district's independent study program where they received personalized math instruction. One student described how much she appreciated that she was working one on one with a teacher who had to try and find more and more ways to explain math concepts until there was a way that worked for her. So again, there's an opportunity for us to think about how schools can provide um, this personalized, individualized support that students experienced as helpful. Next slide, please. So Ilana and I, along with colleagues elsewhere across the country, are interested in pursuing future work focused on reducing inequality related to course taking and tracking for English learners. And one specific research question we're starting to pursue is what malleable factors contribute to math access and achievement outcomes for current and former English learners? And we're also um, interested in expanding this to other content areas as well. So some malleable factors, some of which we've touched on already and some of which we haven't gone into as much detail about yet are math course offerings within schools. EL course placement policies, the extent to which th these three different types of tracking that I want to describe manifest themselves in individual schools, local implementation of state EL reclassification policies, the peer composition of math courses, and teacher qualifications and characteristics. And in addition, there's a new um, data set in Oregon that provides us with data about all K-12 students course taking. And in addition to descriptive analyses using the statewide data, we're interested in doing case studies in schools with different course taking patterns and different outcomes. So I'm going to turn it back to Adam to facilitate our first question period. All right, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Ilana. And uh, folks, it's time for you to supply us with your questions uh, and we will pause a few minutes to answer them. Uh, we've already got a couple questions. Uh, the first one is, what about getting copies of these slides? I'm happy to say that the slides will be posted in a few days after we've had a chance to uh, process the webinar. We'll post them on our website. And then uh, now I'm going to pose a question to Vivian Louie, our program officer here at the William T. Grant Foundation, who is an expert on uh, immigrant uh, uh, children and families and has been uh, doing a lot of work to synthesize research on English learning. Uh, so this is a question that comes from a listener. How can we empower English learners in our classroom? Thank you, Adam. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this important webinar and that's a great question that's been posed to us. And my answer is basically to empower English learners in our classroom, it has to start with teachers and staff in the schools knowing about the lives of English learners who are immigrant children or tend to be outside of the classroom. So how they and their immigrant families experience immigration, life in America, what's happening within their families, within communities. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is also to look at how English learners are experiencing the larger school contact in other classrooms and other aspects of the school life. Okay, and a question for Karen. Um, uh, you focused on math in your research. Uh, one of our listeners has asked whether uh, research has been done in other content areas such as science. Thanks for that question. So um, other researchers have looked at English learners um, 
performance and science ways to organize science classrooms that work for English learners. I'm thinking of work by Corey Buxton, for example, Oki Lee or others who've looked at that. I don't know of other quantitative research focused specifically on science at the high school level, uh, though that is a content area that Ilana and I and our colleagues are looking at with this new Oregon um, course taking data set and we've found some some interesting and concerning things so far. So we're interested in finding out more. Thank you. So it seems like a ripe area for new research. So we have two people who asked us about that. So it seems like uh, something that would be well worth pursuing. A question for Ilana from another one of our listeners. Uh, what role do families play in the tracking of English learner students in middle and high school? Hmm. That's a that's a really interesting question. I don't know of a lot of research that exists in that area. Um, I think it would be relatively context dependent because in some cases, um, families and students themselves are um, able to play a pretty active role in um, choosing their classes, whereas in other schools and contexts, they are not. And most of the course decisions um, gets made by the school or counselors. So I think that's another interesting policy um, to research the impact of is the relative um, power of students and families to make course decisions at the secondary level. Thank you. And Ilana, another question for you, uh, thinking about the implications for future research that you, you described. Have you thought, thought about the locus of policy that is state versus district versus school where some of these malleable factors might occur? Yeah, that's that's another really excellent question. Um, I think that policy, you know, as we see in other areas of research, policy can have, you know, an important impact at all of those levels, um, school-based policy, district-based policy, state policy, and federal policy. Um, I think a lot of the answer to, um, you know, wh where is the potential, where is the power to change policy? And if you're in a location where it seems like the power is primarily at the district level, then to focus there, um, uh, you know, versus federal or state potentially right now. Thank you. Karen, another listener is asking a question and reflecting on a situation this listener has seen in San Francisco, uh, stating that in San Francisco, all students wait to take algebra in ninth grade because of knowledge gaps in eighth grade. And so this listener is asking, how can schools address real gaps in knowledge without placing students in low tracks? Thanks. So as um, Adam and uh, Ilana mentioned, there's also one strategy that we know from other research on tracking that needs to be explored further with English learners is additional instructional time. So I think there's a wide variety of ways in which this is happening and could happen. And it's likely that some of them are more or less helpful, but many schools have math support classes um, and whether those get implemented in a way that, that feels empowering to students and are effective um, is, is an open question. But um, that's one option. Thinking about tutors, one thing that AVID does have is a, a period within the school day, part of which is tutorial, where recent graduates come back to tutor students and actually provide individualized help. So that's that's just one possibility um, that it's worth exploring and researching further. Thank you, Karen. Uh, this is a question for Vivian Louie here at the foundation. Uh, I'm, uh, we got a couple of questions from listeners uh, about the level of uh, students that we might support research on. One person is asking, do, are we most interested in studies at the elementary level or the secondary level of schooling? And another listener is asking whether we support research on community colleges and even four-year colleges. Great, thanks Adam. These are two really important questions. I'm happy to answer them. So my answer is basically yes, um, and that's because of our focal age range at the foundation. The way that we define youth is ages five to 25. So as you might imagine, elementary, secondary school, as well as community college and our four-year institutions would fall under that. Thank you. Um, 
some other listeners are asking about data. Uh, for example, one is asking about surveys uh, done with people who came to the U.S. at very young ages. And I, I think uh, uh, I'll ask this in sequence first to Ilana and then to Karen. Where should people be looking for good data sources to do research on English learners? Uh, Ilana? Um, yeah, so um, one important source of data that Karen and I have both used um, a lot is administrative data from uh, districts and from states. And one of the really exciting um, w things about using administrative data is that oftentimes it's, it, these are through researcher practitioner partnerships. And that's a wonderful way to ground your research questions in questions that are important to the field and to also increase the likelihood that your, um, that your research is actually having an impact on practice. Um, and Karen may want to talk about that more since she's been involved in a lot of really wonderful researcher practitioner partnerships. Um, the other area uh, that there's data on this, um, quantitative data, is through um, national data sets, for instance, things like Eccles, um, uh, Eccles K, uh, or, or I guess Eccles has um, course taking data and other, other um, data sets that um, include access to, to content at the federal level. Uh, so that's that's what I would say about quantitative data. Karen, do you have something to add there? Uh, I would just add that it's useful to understand what states and districts are required to report, what states have to report to the federal government and what districts have to report to the state so that that can give you a sense of what you would be able to get. For example, there are, is federal reporting that states have to do under Title III and that you're, when you're getting a data set that states have already collected, that's a lot less work for them than um, asking them for things that they aren't already gathering from all districts, for example. Thank you. We're getting many, many wonderful questions, and unfortunately, we won't have time to ask them all. One person is asking about research on tracking in monolingual schools, and I'll refer you to the paper of mine that uh, we provided a reference in the dialogue box uh, earlier. Uh, another paper is asking about measuring outcomes. That's a, a crucial question, and we're going to have to uh, move on from that now. I just have time for one last uh, one last question, uh, and it's for you, Karen. And it's about the value of conducting qualitative research uh, to supplement or to illuminate the quantitative findings. Is there always going to need be a need for the quantitative data that often hides it's the reality of the lives of immigrant and English learners, or should we just focus on the qualitative research? I think it really depends on the question that you're interested in pursuing, but in my experience, it's very fruitful to conduct mixed methods research to have quantitative data that, that shows broad patterns and qualitative data that can illuminate things that might be underlying the patterns that are revealed in the quantitative data. Thank you so much for those answers and for all the wonderful questions that have come in. And now we're going to turn it over to Vivian Louie to talk about how the uh, foundation can help support your research on some of these issues. Great. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Ilana and Karen again for um, this wonderful webinar and to all of you who have posed your great questions and are listening in. All right, so my task right now is to really kind of uh, give you some hallmarks of our approach at the foundation. Uh, first, we focus, as I've said already, on young people in the United States, ages five to 25. And second, although we recognize that no single study will lead to major changes, our intention or our goal is for the studies that we fund to culminate in approaches that reduce inequality. And that's why we prioritize programs, policies, and practices. So what might that look like? So studies may focus on how inequality can be reduced by implementing a program, a policy, or a practice. Studies may also address a key dilemma that practitioners or policymakers face in addressing unequality outcomes or they may challenge assumptions that underlie our current approaches. The final thing I want to say is that our portfolio is broadly interdisciplinary, meaning that we draw on ideas and tools from sociology, psychology, economics, 
and other fields and disciplines. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the funding opportunities that we offer at the William T. Grant Foundation. And the first that I'll discuss is research, our major research program. And that is that we fund research that increases our understanding of programs, policies, and practices that reduce inequality in youth outcomes. And these typically range between $100,000 up to $600,000. We also fund research that increases our understanding of the use of research evidence in policy and practice. And this is up to a million dollars. We also have the William T. Grant Scholars Program. This is a developmental award that we offer for promising early career scholars post-doctorate. And it's for $350,000 over five years. And then our most uh, recent uh, and exciting program is the Institutional Challenge Grant. And this is an award for research institutions to build sustained research practice partnerships with public agencies or nonprofit organizations to reduce inequality in youth outcomes. And this is a $650,000 award for three years. Now again, I'm going to focus on research today. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of our grant making strategy and grant making review process. So the first thing I want to say is we have a field initiated grant making strategy. This means that on the front end, we've defined our focus areas, use of research evidence, reducing inequality, and then we uh, issue our request for applications. And on the back end, we fund the strongest applications that we receive. The application process starts with the letter of inquiry, and we receive letters of inquiry in January, May, and August. We conclude our internal review of the letters in about six to seven weeks. And what we pay attention to first is whether the application fits with our current interest and funding criteria. And we invite a subset to show particular promise. Now, the letter of inquiry is only five pages single space, not including your references. So it's, it's not a huge list uh, in that sense, but we do expect that you make a compelling case for what you're proposing to study and how, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But applicants whom we invite to submit a full proposal, we offer the choice of two deadlines. So one is six weeks out uh, from the date of the notification, and we do this because we think that certain teams are pretty much ready to go. The other deadline is about six months out from the date of notification, and this is because we think that some teams will need some time to kind of assemble and move forward with the project. All our deadlines from the letter of inquiry and beyond are queued to one of our board meetings in March, June, and October. I should say here that the full proposals are about 20 to 25 pages single space exclusive of appendices and citations. So here you really have your opportunity to shine and to tell us what you're going to do and how. Once we get the full proposals back in-house, almost all of them are externally reviewed. We choose reviewers for each proposal based on expertise. This could be based on methods or content. And then once we get the external reviews back in, we invite a subset of the team to submit what we call a PI or principal investigator response to respond to the concerns that have come up both externally and internally in the review process. And here what's crucial to our thinking is that we can only give a month for the team to respond. So we're thinking, can the team do it within a month? Okay, so now I'd like to talk about, well, what makes for a strong proposal? Fit to our interests is very important. So the first thing is that the proposed work should align with what we fund. For example, we do not fund operational costs for a program, a service, or an intervention. We do not fund a sabbatical to write a book. We always encourage folks to check out our terrific FAQs on our website about what we do and do not fund. For applications that do meet our eligibility criteria around funding, this then means showing the project's relevance for policy or practice. Applicants should avoid what funders call the trust me tactic. And this is when folks kind of glide over how they might do something, assuming that we'll just simply trust them to execute it. We expect you to actually make a compelling case 
And to do that, we expect to see your concepts defined and explained. We expect to see your strategies laid out and justified. We often get asked at our foundation uh, by applicants whether there's a secret sauce around the topic, the design, and the method. And we always say there isn't. However, there are common good principles that should guide your work. And we see this across applications of diverse topics, designs, and methods. The first is focus. Tell us what you want to do. And just to be clear, this shouldn't be a research agenda. Focus on a particular line of inquiry. And even when you do that, be focused. Don't try to cover the entire waterfront. Number two, provide a compelling rationale. And this is another way of saying, again, make a strong case for why this study is important. For the choices that you've made in your data set and the decision points that you've made in your design. Tell us what the broader frame of learning is beyond what's going to be looked at within the study. And then, at the end of the day, will the research design produce rigorous evidence that will answer the research question? And finally, be clear. Maybe have someone outside your field of expertise read it. Okay, so once again, we're going to pause for some questions. If anybody has questions about uh, pursuing funding for your research from the William T. Grant Foundation, this is the time to pose them. Uh, while, while you're thinking about those questions, I'd like to go back to uh, one question that was asked before, which is about measuring outcomes. Uh, Ilana and Karen, in your uh, remarks earlier, you spoke about ELA outcomes and math outcomes. But one of our listeners is asking about collecting outcomes in the home language, especially in elementary school. What's, uh, what's the uh, cutting edge of research on collecting outcome data in the home language of the uh, student versus the uh, perhaps state standardized assessments, uh, which tend to be in English? Karen, you want to start there? Sure. Um, so. It really varies from uh, state to state, district to district, even school to school, what outcome data is available in students' home languages that's already being collected. Uh, in some cases here in Portland, where I live, um, there's a robust dual language program and there are assessments in um, the home language of students in that program, but not students who aren't in the program. So I think it's um, useful to understand what's happening in the particular context where you're interested in, in getting data um, that's already being collected and it, it really varies. I, I would just add um, one one consideration which is um, that it's it's important to think about are you interested in home language proficiency as an outcome itself um, whether students are are um, maintaining and developing um, literacy, for instance, in their home language. Um, that's a different kind of assessment than, for instance, measuring academic outcomes, such as math or science outcomes, uh, but measuring them in the home language. Um, so those are two different kinds of outcomes, and there are complications with each, for instance, um, you know, we would, it, measuring proficiency in the home language is extremely important when a student is in a bilingual um, educational setting because that's a that's an explicit goal. On the other hand, in terms of academic performance in the home language, um, we wouldn't necessarily expect students to by themselves be able to translate their learning in one language um, into another language. So it can be complicated to teach, for instance, science in English and then measure science knowledge in, in a different in a home language, for instance. So those are just some things to think about. Okay, thank you. We're getting some questions about pursuing grant funding, and we're going to go uh, just a couple of minutes past 1 p.m. because of the technical difficulties we had uh, in trying to start at noon. Uh, one question is uh, about, uh, Vivian, what percentage of grant applications are funded in any given uh, cycle? Sure, that's a great question. Thank you, Adam. So basically, uh, you know, we would say that across our different uh, focus areas, that about uh, three to four percent uh, 
from the letter of inquiry uh, get funded at the end of the day, at the end of the, the cycle. But again, just to remind you both what I've already shared, you know, uh, we also get a lot of applications, or at least a, a substantial number, that don't fit what we fund. Thank you. Uh, another uh, listener is wondering whether we, uh, listeners can reach program officers to bounce ideas off before we set a, uh, submit a letter of, letter of inquiry. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Another great question. So, you know, we are we're certainly interested in everything you know that the field yields. Uh, but because we are a small staff and we receive so many letters of inquiry, you know, hundreds, um, we really don't have the capacity to speak with potential applicants prior to submission of an LOI. Thank, thank you. Uh, here's a question I'd like to take. Uh, is there any expectation that studies should be designed to meet the Department of Education's What Works Clearinghouse standards? And this is a question we often get. Since we are focused on research on ways to reduce inequality, some listeners hear that as we want to fund intervention studies. And of course, we do fund studies of intervention, but that is far from the only type of work that interests us. We are interested in research that builds, understands, tests, and improves programs, policies, and practices to reduce inequality. In fact, Vivian Louie has a wonderful blog post on our website, or uh, essay on our website in a recent issue of the William T. Grant Foundation Digest on using mixed methods and qualitative research to gain insight into ways to reduce inequality. So uh, it is certainly not a precondition that research that we would support would meet the What Works Clearinghouse standards. Although I would add that research that aims to assess impact should, of course, have a design that's suitable to reach conclusions about impact. Another question is about whether we fund research conducted outside the U.S. that can have policy and practice implications across schools and countries. Unfortunately, we have a domestic focus. We support research on ways to reduce inequality among young people ages 5 to 25 in the United States. It is possible that we would fund a uh, comparative research if our funding supported the U.S. research on a comparative international sample, but we do not support research outside the U.S. We, of course, appreciate that ideas about important research can come from all over the world. That can be an important spark to research but our mission is uh, focused uh, domestically. 